There is a wild spirit within us. It drives us to the precipice of impossible challenges and calls us to imagine a better future. There are those who embrace this spirit. They greet impossible feats with unreasonable determination and will stop at nothing short of breakthrough. We call them entrepreneurs. It is a grueling path. When you work at the edge of what's possible, success has no formula. And lessons are hard won through trial and error. For those whose imagination is at odds with the status quo, the risk is high. The hours are long. And success is uncertain. Breakthrough can seem impossible. But breakthrough does not need to happen alone. Mars is a community of entrepreneurs in the heart of Canada's leading innovation district. Mars gives entrepreneurs a platform to collaborate, discover, and commercialize their ideas to improve the future of energy, work, education, and healthcare. Mars, our future matters. I still get goosebumps. Hi, I'm Zena. I uh, lead the health platform at Mars. So Mars is what I've been telling people is the Canadian singularity. Um, it was a, a very ambitious project, uh, so ambitious that they just called it Mars, and then we retrofitted an acronym uh, of convergence, so medical and related sciences, but we just go by Mars. Um, and there's uh, one of the 200,000 visitors uh, that come through Mars a year to kind of check out the model and the energy of this incredible space to kind of converge a copy of everything you need to really make breakthroughs happen. Um, so to give you a sense of physically, this is downtown Toronto. That water is Lake Ontario. To your right is Niagara Falls. I'm sure you've all been there for your honeymoon or whatever. Um, and uh, that kind of space there is the Mars complex, which is a one and a half million square feet of 100% innovation space. About uh, 200 different organizations call it home. Companies like Johnson & Johnson J-Labs, Canada, Facebook Canada's head office, Autodesk is now moving in their whole R&D center into Mars. Uh, VCs, about 100 startups, big science, and um, a lot of intermediaries, and a lot of uh, conference activity in this space. Um, the origins kind of go back to um, some history of this land in this area, which is a very dense uh, kind of medical discovery uh, area. In 1921, uh, in the building across from Mars is where insulin was discovered by Banting and Best. In the building where I work in Mars, the old Toronto General Hospital, which was decommissioned, is where the first child in the world ever got insulin, the first clinical trial with a 13-year-old boy. I think one of our VCs is in that, uh, that hospital room. And then the discovery continued with uh, the discovery of stem cells uh, in Toronto in 1961. And so when Canada was kind of trying to figure out in the late 90s, you know, how are we going to compete in the global innovation race and uh, participate in the innovation economy, um, this very ambitious project um, emerged. And it really was um, uh, kind of like the Ray and Peter of Canada, two really exemplary Canadian philanthropists, visionaries, business leaders in the biotech space that gathered uh, 14 philanthropists together and put a project together and bought the land and created the Mars Center. So it was civic entrepreneurship before we started using that language in 2000. So let's unpack this word entrepreneurship because that's the theme of the morning. So we can credit the word to uh, Joseph Schumpeter. So he's an Austrian born American economist who really um, is the foundation of our understanding of this word entrepreneurship. So he defined the entrepreneur as this, this person who's both willing and able, and I bolded it, to take an idea or an invention into something successful. And then there's these attributes of these people called entrepreneurs. Vision is a big word, and this impulse, this restlessness, to kind of fight and tackle down whatever they're trying to improve on, but at the same time, joy in that whole process. 
as grueling and hard as it is. And so much like many of you where kind of this whole entrepreneurship startup movement started, um, Mars kind of said, you know, health has got a lot of problems. We've all got our version of the from two. We've heard all of these today. Um, that transition and these dislocations is going to need the passion and the mindset of the entrepreneur to make those shifts. And so we kind of set out on that for, for, to create Canada's kind of global address for health innovation um, for entrepreneurs. And lo and behold, uh, there's a whole ecology of entrepreneurs emerging as the means of production to do something about the restlessness you have about the healthcare system uh, and the tools and the kind of acceptance grows and grows. And I'll give my shout out to the nursepreneurs out there. I know we, we called them, I think, entrepreneurs uh, yesterday. Um, and so these are the community that we work with that come at us from every direction that kind of want to take this path. And so our model, you know, much like many other um, incubators, accelerators, kind of startup ecosystems, is to provide a suite of services to kind of nurture these budding entrepreneurs and fill whatever gaps they need to kind of short circuit their path to hopefully pop, make a big difference, and in our case, you know, build Canada's kind of next generation high growth companies. In particular for us, it was important because we're a very, very heavily resource dependent economy, very, very big floppy geography with lots of stuff in the ground that we can harvest. So it's been hard to make that transition. And so we did that from about 2000 to now. We now have a portfolio of about 250 health startups of all types. And you might recognize some of these I've kind of highlighted. Uh, iCarrot and CloudDX are uh, over in the Innovation Lab. Uh, Muse, I think, has been on this stage, the founder, Ariel. Uh, and Caplex is an interesting one that just got acquired by Miraculous, which I think is a singularity uh, emerging company. So we kind of solved Valley of Death one, if you will, in the first 10 or so years of Mars. And Canada really was nowhere on the startup scene of converting academic IP or just ideas into something of commercializable value. But then what we found was, you know, this kind of transition, and I heard the word paradigm shift at least 100 times at this conference. Paradigm shifts don't happen on their own. They need a big revolution of some sort to make that change. And we've heard every version of all these things that get in the way of the dislocation that everybody knows is going to come, but a lot of these things are in the way. Well, that's uh, where Schumpeter comes back in because he gave us another language in his kind of seminal paper in 1934, which is creative destruction. So he described creative destruction, to bring a medical metaphor, as industrial mutation. So this, this, he called it the gale of creative destruction is what the entrepreneur brings, or entrepreneurship brings. It's this wave that you know, replaces systematically the inferior technology or innovation of the day, and that sweeps across markets, industries, and ecosystems. And that's kind of precisely what uh, medicine is going through. It's being creatively destroyed, dismantled, and then remantled back together, and that's the work of, uh, or initiated by entrepreneurs. But you can't just be the tech entrepreneur and creatively destroy extremely complex adaptive system. You might be able to drive some incremental innovation in a hospital ward, but you know, this is kind of the cycle of maturity, destruction, and rebirth uh, of any industry market or a society or economy. And the birth is the entrepreneur that's that spark of action from their vision. Eventually, it becomes the status quo and the normal, and then things just don't feel right and then we creatively destroy. And so uh, top-down linear ways to solve problems won't work when you're in a system. So from hierarchy to more panarchy, uh, where you know, one step affects the other, and to get the dislocation, multiple scales of innovation have to be happening. So you need entrepreneurs at the firm, but at the team, at the org, at the industry, and all the way up to civil society. And that is not the job of the individual tech entrepreneur to do. And so our kind of thesis and we discovered really quickly, if we don't deploy as much resource, effort, energy on the adoption side of innovation and creating intrapreneurs at all those scales, uh, there's kind of no point on the supply side. And then we've got some really strategic initiatives that my team oversees that take on the big bottlenecks around data liquidity, adoption, procurement, that are fundamentally going to challenge the flow of innovation. So the right side is kind of what I do every day. Uh, and so we're building the next generation of intrapreneurs. 
And so, you know, why is it important? So we all know the ecology of the entrepreneur is in a temporary uh, organization trying to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up, uh, but really hard to get incumbents to, you know, behave like startups, so kind of walk and chew gum. And we've all seen these org charts, you all know these people, you probably meet with them. And so we created a kind of um, ecosystem of these are all hospitals, retail pharmacies, and other distribution arms of our health delivery system that have all built an in-house innovation something, and then we kind of work together to build capacity for innovation. And then we've taken that to the corporate level. What I've been loving about the Mars model, we're in health, but we're also in fintech, clean tech, and ed tech. And so the, the R of Mars, the Mars and related, the convergence of the banking into health and health into clean tech is kind of what we're seeing. And then these are some of our corporate partners. So um, uh, our equation of innovation is you need the invention, you need the adoption, and then you get the innovation, and therefore you need entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship to get the impact.